Well, I've got a project to build, and this has been sponsored by PCB Way. They gave me these boards at no cost, so make sure you check out the links down below and check out their services. There are all sorts of things there. They even do prototyping for manufacture, like they do 3D printing and machining and all sorts of stuff now. They do quite a vast array of things. So it's not just PCBs now, they do a whole bunch of other stuff. They also do assembly as well. So if I'd probably chosen to, I could have actually had this board assembled. So this is the one of the boards which has been sent to me. So we'll have a look in the box. So they sent me another pen. Thank you much. Also don't forget to click like and subscribe. Here's a stack of boards. And it's their seventh anniversary. They gave me some stickers. Right now, we just need a single board. Now this project is my law to Wi-Fi gateway. Well, it was my law to Wi-Fi gateway. I've now changed it. It's now a law to Wi-Fi and LAN gateway. So what I've actually done is I've designed this to have one of these plug-in modules, one of these W5500 modules which do Ethernet. I've got no idea if this is even going to work. I haven't prototyped this. I've just designed it and hoped that it works. In theory, it should. But uh, anyway, we'll find out. I didn't want to change the footprint of the board. I wanted the board to be the same size. So I had to do a couple of little bodges on here in a way. So I've actually got an overlap between these two boards here. Now this board here is actually the DC power supply. This is a DC to DC converter because it runs on a 24 volt-ish supply. It's actually up to about 29 volts or so max. And that will go on here. But what I'm going to have to do is offset it slightly to one side. Just to allow room for this capacitor here. So that when I've got the module here, which is the USB32 plugged in, they don't clash. Now I had to do that because of board size. I didn't want to make the board any bigger, like I said. I could have maybe squeezed this over that way a little bit more and, and just made a bit more space in that direction. This is already maxed out. That's where the connections for the TFT. So this is very similar to one I did before, which I'll probably link in up there or something, which is the original Law to Wi-Fi Gateway project. And I did show me building that before. And the only difference is that I wanted to add on this module here and try and use a Ethernet LAN instead of Wi-Fi. I mean, Wi-Fi will still be part of the programming, it's part of the software, but the idea is to try and use the LAN as the primary connection, and then you use Wi-Fi as a fallback. So if the LAN falls over for some reason, then I'll drop onto Wi-Fi and use that instead as, as a redundancy. Right now I'm trying to use two redundant Wi-Fi networks, but I had a glitch at an event recently where the Wi-Fi was connected, but it couldn't communicate for some reason. I don't know what there happened, but my intention was always to go to a LAN anyway, and that just helped to push me along and actually get this thing underway, you know? Right, so that's the module there. In here is an ESP32, brand new. We'll see if it's damaged or not, because the package did seem a bit squashed. Yeah, pins are slightly bent, not too worried about it. It's just, yeah, kind of straight now. <laughs> so that will actually go on a header. And it goes that way around. But what I actually have is these female headers here as I use these. So what I can do is when I'm programming the boards potentially, um, or if I have an issue with a failure, I can just unplug a board, plug a new program board in, carry on. Right? It's not a total disaster then. So it makes repair really easy to plug the things in and out as required. This may not end up being plugged in because of the height of the boards. I've got a restricted height as well. So I think I actually need to sit this right down on the board instead. This is a really small clearance here, basically pushed right down. So I don't think I can use a socket on this. But this I'll use sockets on because I know this fits. This we stood off slightly on little legs. Because I need to offset this with the ESP32. So once this is actually on a socketed header, it will sit slightly higher, but not high enough to go over top of that capacitor there. So it's going to actually clash, so I can't put them underneath each other. I would have liked to. I mean, if I change that capacitor, I could take the capacitor off and, and put a capacitor on there, which is laying down. I mean, that would work. And I could actually put it in the right place. I'm not too worried about it. I, show you, I knew that was part of the design. I knew it was going to be an issue I was going to be having. It was a compromise I had to make. And also got a few electric capacitors here, different ones. I've got some PTCs here. These are 900 milliamp PTCs, which are plenty. And I've got a 6.2 volt Zener, which I'm using as a clamp protection. 0.1 ohm resistor here, which is used for inrush current. As a connection for this capacitor here, it's a big bulk cap, um, just to help reduce the inrush currents. I did a video on this recently, and I actually showed the inrush examples, depending on the resistance in line, to see how much current you actually got as an inrush. And I did a video on that, showing all that. It's quite interesting. It actually did quite well with that video. And as a result, that's part of my experiments to see what I actually needed on this board. This is a 0.1 ohm, which is going to be in series with the capacitor. So the capacitor is in series with that resistor across the power supply after the buck converter. So that's just there to help reduce inrush current. 
and the PTC is straight on the output of the bucket footer so that if it does have a short or something on that line, something goes wrong with the electronics you won't short the back converter out and hopefully not kill it that's the plan and I've also got one the input in case the back converter fails I've also got a AMS 3117 3.3 volt regulator here, linear regulator now that's actually exactly the same regulator that's on the ESP32 board now I kind of could have got away with using the 3.3 volt supply off this board to power the other stuff on here which is basically TFT display I think it's a touch sensor uses that and the module here which is run at 3.3 volts and I thought well I could run it off here but I thought well I'd rather have a separate supply and isolate things a bit more and putting this on here means I've got control of it that's isolating the supplies that's reducing the stress on this board reduces the stress on that very slightly so shearing the load makes it a bit more reliable it's a bit more of a bulletproof system rather than relying on one regulator to try and do the whole lot if I spread it across two regulators it's going to be a little bit more reliable hopefully less likely to be stressed that kind of stuff I do intend to over engineer things so that regulator could handle it in theory but I want to have two separate regulators just to share the loading okay let's get into it let's build this thing one other thing I forgot to mention I've got some capacitors in here these 100 nanofarad capacitors for just general noise on the supply line so I need some of these now that's all the parts I think. So the first thing I'll do is install the service mount parts and that way we don't have to worry about them getting in the way. So we've got a capacitor that sits just there. I'm going to use a bit of flux on this. I'm going to hand solder these rather than using um, pastry like that. There's only a few of them. It's not too much to do. I'm just checking. I think that is all of them. So let's get the regulator tacked on there first. Then we'll do the small parts. I should actually get my extractor fan going too, thinking about it. Alright, oh, it's going to be a little bit noisier now, I'm afraid, but uh, that's what it is. So let's just tack on here. I'm going to put some solder on one pad of each part. What I'll probably do is once I get these things soldered down is actually probably hit it with hot air and just let them self-align. But for the time being we'll just get the things soldered. Now this has got quite a bit of thermal mass around here so it's not surprising it's struggling a little bit. I could actually turn my iron up a little bit but I don't want to have too much heat. It's only it's one part which needs it. Now, I usually use 0603s but this time I'm going to use the 805s just because I've got some sitting around. I think I've lost one. I've lost one. One, two, three. Okay, let's solder these on. Like I said, I'm just going to get these down and I'll use hot air on them to get them better down properly. First thing is getting on the board. Let's get the hot air in this thing and we'll bed them all down properly. We'll try and do this without getting in your way. We might turn the sun chuck a little bit. It's being a bit slow to get this done. There you go, that's that one. Now I'm on 370, should be a little quicker. Here we go, that's that one. Alright, this next thing I need to do is do these headers. One. 
This is what I do is I just plug them into this board. That way they're basically aligned with this with this module and I just go straight on. Here as well, plug that in. Cut this one off here. Okay, now let's line that up. Like that. Solder this on. It does make it go a little bit better if you use a bit of flux. This means more clean up at the end, that's all. What I'm just doing is making sure the head is pushed right down and is seated properly. Then I can go through and do all the other pins. Alright, so that should be secured. It's looking alright. Let's solder the rest of the pins. Now, if I pulled this board out now, it would actually potentially pull the pins out of the housing, the actual plastic housing. It could pull them straight out. So you can't pull it out until you've actually got all the pins soldered in. Learn that one once. <laughs> and it's still around 300 degrees, I'm not going to go to 350. Just makes it a bit quicker. Oh, turn this big one. Again, go back the other way because there'll be a chance for a bit of heat soak so it passes right through the board. Just give you a chance to have another look at the joints, make sure we don't have solder on all of them. That's that side. Should be good. Need to clean up. Got this problem with using hot uh, temperature as well, so here's the bin of flux, but uh, this makes it hard to clean. So we'll clean it off now. Gives a fighting chance. Now I've been doing a lot of cleaning over time, but Sometimes if you clean up as you go, it makes it a little bit easier at the end because you haven't got this old, dry, crusty stuff still sitting there. So, there you go. That's that bit done. This module here I'm not going to put in until last because I need to install the power supply and test it because I can unplug this before I hook this up. Um, I need to make sure the power supply is okay, it looks good. I don't want to risk blowing up one of these modules if there's a problem. And also, if you look at this module, you see the legs are slightly spread out, so I actually need to realign those legs to get it in the board anyway. Right, so this is the 220 microfarad 25 volt that goes in that one. Reinforcement for the 3.3 volt supply. Now, actually, I also need to look at this because this module, I'll turn it upside down, is really close to this capacitor. I don't have much room there. So, with that module in place, it's going to be sort of, well, about there. So I've just got to make sure that capacitor isn't in the way of that hole. I was thinking I might have to lean the capacitor over or something, but it looks like I've got just enough room to actually get that plug in and out. Just there, you see? I knew it was going to be close. It's one of the things I was keeping on. So that's fine. That's that capacitor there. We'll put that in place. Next one here, we've got a 16 volt 470 microfarad that goes over here. It goes there like that. Now I've got to be careful about it. Now I've actually got these header pins here. I'm not going to populate them but they're there for future expansions and stuff like that. I'm not going to populate those particular headers rows here. They're just spares. That's how I haven't got down. I need to get the connectors for these. So we've got one microfarad. That goes in here. Which way? <laughs> I can't see the mark. Plus is that side. Such a small footprint. So that goes right there like that. This one microfarad is a trick which I figured out for these ESP32 modules, I'll discuss this. I mentioned it before. Now what I've actually done my other modules is I've got a capacitor and sold it between the enable pin and the ground pin over here. So let's get like a, one of these one microfarad caps. And I'll usually set the cap out here, run the legs down here with some insulation, like um, heat shrink on the legs between the ground and the enable pin. And if you have a one microfarad cap between those two pins, when you're trying to program it, it will always program. Sometimes you have problems with you have to hold the boot pin down, I think there's a boot one. Well, then boot or no, commentary one you have to push down. And in order for the program to work, 
And they're usually on the very first upload it will work, but sometimes in subsequent uploads it won't work. It depends on your libraries and what pins you're using on the actual device. It can cause problems. So I found all my stuff I'm using these for, I have to hold the button down. It's a bit of a pain in order to get the programming enabled. So what I always do now, as a matter of course, is I put a capacitor on the board. Now what I've actually done, instead of putting on, messing around putting on here, I'll just build it onto this board instead now. So I can just plug the board into the which board it is. I've got a capacitor across that pin and it'll help it to enable programming. Another thing I've actually enabled is over-the-air programming. So I actually use over-the-air on these now as well. But the initial programming, or if I'm doing programming with the cable, then you need that capacitor. Over-the-air programming doesn't require it. So if you're only doing over-the-air, it doesn't matter at all. So we've got a 6.2 volt zinner, which is, like I said, this is for clamping. It's going to go across here. This is purely across the supply from the buck converter. Yeah, cut it like down. Excellent. That's just to clamp it. So if the buck converter fails and tries to shove the full line voltage straight out, that Zeno should clamp it and then that should overload the PTC which should then cause the PTC to activate and hopefully protect everything else. That's the plan. 0.1 ohm resistor here, which is say it's for that capacitor just there. I don't normally like to put a resistor next to a capacitor but in this case it doesn't matter, it's only for the cap's own supply so it's not going to get hot. We've got a 35 volt 47 microfarad, that's one of these over here, which is the reinforcement of the 5 volt rails, local to where it needs it. It doesn't need a lot of capacitance, but I just like to do capacitance scattered around the ball just to help with local noise and regulation. So I'll put that one there. This footprint's actually the right ones for these devices. I've actually used larger capacitors in the past, but not this time. Now, PTC. This is the input power PTC. So this one is a protection for the whole board, including the buck converter. So I so we'll show that in there. Footprint isn't right. I sort of guessed at the footprint. I didn't actually know what size I was going to need. I guessed it's close. <laughs> uh, right. Then we got this one as well, which needs to go over here. I was going to have a resistor in here. Is what I originally played with, which I'll show you this. Let me just check this. I'll come back. Don't forget to click like and subscribe. And here we go. Here's a PTC resistance, which is 0.17 ohms. Now, lead resistance is 0.1. See what it settles down to. 0 0.07. So I think it's 0.1 ohms across the PTC itself. If we chance to settle again, it's changed. Get a better connection. So, yeah, that basically is 0.1 ohms across the actual PTC, which is very similar to the resistor I was going to use. So, um, I'm happy using that. I also need some header for the TFT display. So, let's get this sorted out. Yep, that one there. So, there's the header for that, it goes on the back of the board. Now, I probably should just buy headers at the right size for the stuff I'm doing, but I'm always doing different stuff, so. You know, it's just sometimes easier just to make them as you go. So it's just tack this on as well. Should have got some flux on it first, it would have been easier. Okay, gotta get that straight. That's straight there, let's tug gathering done. Make sure it's pushed down. Okay, we'll tack this on now. And what I like to do as well is um, let the heat soak through the board so it definitely goes right through to the other side. So I do tend to dwell on these a bit more than I probably should, but that's just about what I find works for me. Okay, that's the header in place. Now we put these parts on this side. Actually I'll clean this flux off this side first. Before it gets too hard to get off.
I just wanted to make that shorter brush so it's a bit more scrubby. That's fine. Okay, I'll do this side. We really need to get one of those PCB holders, those little ones you can spin around, they'll be quite convenient. Not very expensive to get, I should just get one. I do have one of those Panavice things, which is nice, pretty rock solid, but um, sometimes it's just too much. Sometimes you just need something small to hold it on. Usually with this stuff, the hardest thing is the ground plane side of it, because it's ground planes, so it tends to suck the heat away. The incapacitors and stuff, off from the ground planes. And sometimes I also come around afterwards and just make sure the parts are seated down by pushing on them as I solder them. Because the thing with hanging upside down like this is sometimes they don't sit quite right. Well, this one here was wobbling, so let's just give this one a touch up. So I've also got to put these JST connectors on. Seven pin JSTs. You know, fish those out of the box, I keep them in. Now, something I forgot to change on this provision is these capacitors getting further away from these connectors. They just fit, but um, they're very close. I didn't change this part of the board, really. But that capacitor is a little bit on the close side. It just goes. I think I might just snip that connector very slightly. Small oversight on my part. I'll come back. So I just kept a little bit of trim, just on that very edge there. You can see it's sticking out. Didn't trim it very well. Just here. Let's cut that extra leg piece off because it like these little feet sticks out the side. Let's cut one of them off and that'll fit then. I forgot to change it on the revision but uh, it might. Put it back in. Now it fits properly. So, we'll sew the those on. Don't forget to click like and subscribe. Interested in projects or repairs or electronic stuff and make sure you subscribe. I'm pretty sure I put this in the right around. <laughs> I'll double check in a sec. Too late now. So good, coming me along. So I think I'm at the point now I need to put the DC to DC converter in and then we'll uh, tune all that up, get that working, make sure it's okay and then we can worry about the rest. So it's a shame I can't quite get the ESP32 and that in there at the same time. You see this doesn't quite go. It's not quite, you know, it's a real shame. But, uh, oh well, never mind. So what I'm going to do is just put some of these wires that I cut off those legs of those components, especially the thick ones, so they've got a bit of strength to them. Stick these through these holes, solder those on, and then I'll thread them through the holes on the board and stand it off very slightly at a slight angle. It's all pretty simple. That's the plan anyway. Sometimes simple wasn't always the right way to go, but... And when I actually put it in place, I'll resolder these again. The first thing is to get it in place. So in is over here, and that's this corner here, right? So in and out. So it's actually kind of flipped over, but I've got the power comes into this middle, passes through that PTC into the board, back out here, and then goes straight into the LCD module or TFT module, and then the, the clamping then runs along here. So. 
So it's not an ideal situation doing it this offset method, but um, fortunately that's what I need to do at the moment. This didn't quite fit. I mean, I could have taken this capacitor off and put it in place properly, but I just want to stagger it off like this. There you go, just like that. And then it doesn't clash with the SP32, hopefully. And that might also help the cooling as well, maybe. I don't know. Um, let's check the SP32 on here, make sure it's actually not going to clash. That's fine. Push it down so it's basically touching it, I suppose. Then I've got to set the voltage on this thing. I could have actually done it before I put the thing on the ball, but uh, I have it the easy way. I should come back once I've cleaned up. Let's hook up the power supply. I've got it set to 25 volts. I might drop it down a bit before I turn the power on. So go down, say, 10 volts. This issue should be set to 5. That one I'm going to be putting too much voltage or anything else. So let's get the multimeter here. And I'll show you what I'm doing. Alright, multimeter's here. Let's probe on. And then I'll turn the power supply on. A couple of convenient points right here I can probe onto. There are other ones, but this one's right where I want it to go. So there's the adjustment right there. Let's turn the power on. That's pulling an amp. Why is that pulling an amp? We have 7 volts coming out. That's why it's drawing an amp, because I've got the diode over here is clamping it. So that diode there will be clamping across that supply. So that's okay. So what I need to do then, so the, I know you said I know the diode clamp's working. Um, let's drop the voltage down to say 5 volts. Oh, let's go 6 volts. Now, we'll turn it on again. There we go, now drawing 30 milliamps. It's sitting at 5.4 volts. So let's wind this until we get it dropping down. I'm not sure which way it's got to go. Here we go, now we're under control. And the current's dropped down to 11 milliamps. So we'll put this voltage up now. Let's go to 10 volts. Now what we can actually do is wind this up until that diode starts to clamp. So it's at 5 volts now. Everything that's on the board right now is safe. Current's starting to increase to 6.2. 6.4 is doing 160 milliamps. So, yeah, that's about 7 volts or so, it's clamping a bit harder. Probably not enough, really. I think it may have actually gone to a 5.6 rather than a 6.2. Yeah, I think it may have actually gone to 5.6. Anyway, we'll set it to 5.1 volts. Or thereabouts. With no loading, obviously. So that will change when it's got some loading on it. And I'm being a bit fussy about that. Anyway, 5.1 volts. We'll do it there. And we'll plug stuff in and see what happens. Actually, I should check the 3.3 volt rail. Make sure it's working okay. In case there's a problem there. There you go, 3.3. That's working. So that's good. Alright, so let's do this now. I've already straightened the legs up a little bit. I just basically leaned on them like this and ran the soldering iron down each pin until the legs gradually moved over so they're now straight. So it should now fop, drop into the ball. It does, look at that, perfect. So that's a good height. It's also got a bit of a standoff on there. Power is off. So there's a slight gap between the ball and the rest of it, which is perfect. Nothing's touching. See through this, this is a very slight gap there, so that's exactly what I want. Very happy with that. 
So what I'm going to do here is actually solder this board on. I'm going to solder these legs directly on. I'm not going to use a head or anything like that. I'm just going to put it on as it is and hope that there's no mistakes. Getting it back off again could be interesting actually. So my theory about using plug-in modules is that someone else has already done all the hard work trying to design and get it working. And all you've got to do is interface to it. And if a module fails, you just got to remove that module, put a new one on. And it makes repairs a lot easier, you know, in the field repairs. Now in this case I'm soldering this thing in because I'm not sure I've got enough height to have a socket. Now it may be that that's a mistake and I don't actually have room for a socket. And if that's the case, then when I make another one, because I need to make two of these, I will put headers on it and make it um, a bit bigger. But obviously, I'm going to gain the height of that socket instead, you know, so it's going to be standing up by quite a bit more. Right now, it's still fairly compact, so anyway, we're getting there. So, here we go, I've uh, fully assembled the board. There's a display module already installed. Now, I actually had one on this board here, which is the original version. I use this for the ESP32 pre touch stick. So I built one of those before from, is it Dustin Watson's design? Hey Dustin. And the unit wouldn't work on my computer, I had some issues with it. So I know it works fine with other people's computers, just my computer wasn't very happy with it and I play around with it a bit and end up getting a proper stream deck instead in the end. My wife bought me one, so I didn't need this anymore. So well, that was a great project and it would have been fine for other people, it didn't suit me. So what I've actually just done is I've just taken this display off this and attached it to this. All right, so this is the new version and this is basically the old version you can see here that the power supply obviously is here, used to be up this way and I basically I just rejigged this area to squeeze everything in the spot, you can see why and basically the ESP stuff is always exactly the same, this side of the board is basically the same apart from that extra regulator I put inside there on this version. We shall try this out shortly and see if it works. Don't forget to click like and subscribe. Thanks PCBWay for supporting me and supplying the PCB to me at no cost. Make sure you check that out, the link's down below, you go to PCBWay and purchase stuff from them, they do lots of stuff, go and check them out. Anyway, we'll power this up and we'll see if it works. We'll see. <laughs> so, negative on that side, positive on this side. This will probably ask for the spray calibration. I programmed the USB 32. Which way up it's supposed to go? I think it's supposed to be that way. You will find out. Let's turn the power on, I've got 10 volts still. Power is on, upside down. All right, so it didn't ask to do the display calibration and it's failing to connect, which is not surprising because there's no network turned on and there's also no ethernet connection. So LAN says no, Wi-Fi says no, and it's got these failures, which is fine. It's exactly what I expected to have. But I need to do the display calibration. I'm pretty sure I need to do that. Yeah, it's not popping up. Yep, I need to do the display calibration. So I need to reprogram this to force it to do a calibration of the display and then I can use this one. So I think I've finished the code on this thing. I've been playing with it for a little while off and on. Got the Ethernet cable on here. Let's power this thing up off the supply and we'll see what happens. It should catch the network here in my office because I'm plugged into it directly obviously and it should get the time. So let's see what happens. Um, this not this voltage is currently yeah, I showed like 20, 26 volts in, we'll shut that in and see what happens. That's going to be realistic, what it's going to be running from. That's about 600 milliamps, sorry, 65 milliamps going in. So it takes a minute to connect to the actual LAN. There you go, LAN's connected. Now it's getting the time. It got the time successfully. So that's all good, that's working. I'm going to go and put this in the motorhome now, hook it up to its network, and we'll see what happens. Um, I've got a few little things to work on, like getting the cable into the case, that kind of thing. So here's the unit which is normally in the case. This is the existing one here. And this is the case it sits in, which has got the lower modules in the top section just up here. With the cables coming out and stuff. So this just drops in there. And this will do the same, that's why I wanted to keep this, the board size exactly the same. So this is the original version, I've just unbolted it, I've basically made a duplicate. This will go as a spare, most likely. Always have backups and redundant systems. Always have them. 
Yes, and there's that example I was saying before about having a capacitor on the back of the USB 32 between ground and the enable pin in order to get the programming to be a bit simpler when you're trying to set these things up. And now I've built it onto that board instead, so I didn't need to do it anymore. So yes, the tricky thing I've got here is obviously the cable sticking out the side. I knew this could potentially be a problem. I I do have some other plugs and stuff because obviously this is a full size get unhooked full size plug with a strain relief on it. Look at that. That's really nicely done, isn't it? <laughs> right, so I plug that back in, not that. So without the strain relief on it, you can actually get the wires around, right? So I have kind of allowed for this. That will actually fit without a strain relief on it. Right, so I'm okay with that part. But um, I won't be using this cable, I don't think. I'm using something else. I might, I might have to make a cable. It's not a big deal. So don't forget to click like and subscribe. And thanks so much, PCB Way, for sponsoring this project. Catch you next time.